Good evening, everyone, and we're ready for another edition of On the Porch with Pastor, reading from Hometown Tales by Philip Gully. Tonight's installment is called The Birdhouse. A friend of mine has a serene office. <laughs> I have all kinds of friends out here to keep me company. A friend of mine has a serene office with rocking chairs and windows on two sides that look out into, into woods. The windows have screens. In warm weather, he opens the windows and listens to the birds. Once when I was visiting, I noticed a weathered birdhouse hanging on his wall. Why do you have a birdhouse in your office? I asked him. That was my grandfather's, he told me. Then he told me how it came to hang on his wall. The story began in 1949 in a little southern Indiana town. It was a Sunday morning in early June. My friend's Aunt Betty had just graduated from high school. Betty and her family attended the Baptist church where they were singing the opening hymn one Sunday when Betty noticed a handsome young man across the aisle. He was a traveling Baptist, passing through on business. She knew nothing about him, but by the third verse, had fallen in love with his strong jaw. Two weeks later, she went away with him, and they were married. A year later, the traveling Baptist left her, and Betty returned home with a baby girl. Her father went to the train station to pick them up and drive them home. Betty sobbed the whole way. Her tears rained down on her baby. Her daddy told her, You're always welcome to stay with us. Your mother and I still love you. You know that, don't you? The next Sunday, he took Betty and his little granddaughter back to church, and when people whispered about them, he stood tall, daring anyone to look crossways at them. When the preacher talked against divorced people and pointed fingers, Betty's father reached over and put his arm around his daughter and drew her close. My grandfather was a wonderful man, my friend told me. He took in his little granddaughter, and he loved her as his own. From the first moment he saw her in his daughter's arms at the train station, he became a father to her. He taught her how to swim at Dewart Lake, and how to swing a bat, and pitch a ball so no one could hit it. He taught her the kind of things father teach, fathers teach their daughters. Then he came down with cancer. He spent his last spring on the back porch. His granddaughter sat with him. He was 65, and she was 12. He was wrapping things up. She was just getting started. They sat on the back porch and listened to the birds, much like I'm doing tonight. He taught her their songs. That's a wren. Over there in the linden tree is a mockingbird. Oh my, there's a bluebird on the fence row. You don't see them often. One day in early May, she said, Grandpa, let's go to town and buy a birdhouse. They walked down to Fleming's Hardware and bought a birdhouse shaped like a log cabin and hung it from the back porch eaves and watched a wren build her nest and hatch her young. That birdhouse was the last thing he ever bought. He died a month later. Today it hangs in my friend's office. He looks at it and remembers how a man opened his arms to a hurting daughter and her little baby how he went to church and stood tall in the face of gossip and drew his daughter close when the stairs grew hard. He died when my friend was one year old. He doesn't remember anything about his grandfather. All that he has from him is one birdhouse and the stories others tell about him. His Aunt Betty remarried. She's 70 years old now and an elder in that same Baptist church, the first female elder they've ever had. Whenever young people in the church divorce, she ministers to them. She visits them in their homes and tells them, we still love you, you know that, don't you? She takes them back to church and if other people look hard at them, she stands tall and puts her arm around them and draws them close. One time the preacher got to talking about divorce and naming names. The next day Betty paid him a visit in his office and told him a little story about a young woman fresh out of high school in 1949. He fell in love with a young man and went away to get married and 
how to her deep shame and sorrow, it didn't work out. She's felt guilty about it ever since. People still talk about it. Maybe, she told the preacher, instead of pointing fingers, you can encourage these young people who've had their lives torn apart. Maybe you can help them put their homes back in order instead of pointing out the disrepair. The preacher listened and learned. I listened to this story on an early summer day while sitting in my friend's office. The windows were open. A woodpecker beat a staccato rhythm high in a beech tree. My friend identified the bird, plucking its genus from somewhere deep in his genes. Yet another gift from his grandfather. I rocked back and forth and thought on the vagaries of self-control and how it is that God redeems even a hasty decision made back in 1949. I considered how God has salvaged my many failures, how God has met me at my places of shame, how he's drawn me close and helped me stand tall. One more father doing the best he can by his child. Friends, how much better would the world be if we long to help our fallen brothers and sisters regain the state of grace they've lost instead of kicking them when they're down? Years ago, I heard a saying, and I can't remember who, who was attributed to, or I would give credit where credit is due, but the saying went something like this. Christians are the only species that shoot their wounded. Friends, I hope that's not true of you or your fellowship. Because God didn't call us to condemn. He called us to be the salt and light and to help heal wounds. He himself said he didn't come to condemn the world, but that by him the world might be saved. So encourage one another while you can. I think it'd go a long way, especially in this season. And uh, know that we love you, and Jesus is coming soon. So eyes to the skies.